With America at war in the Atlantic and the Pacific, one aircraft carrier firmly stood out from the rest. It was USS Wolverine, one of the oddest ships in United States Navy history. Initially built and used as a luxury cruiser on the Great Lakes, the sidewheel steamer had a second life during World War II, when she was fitted with a flight deck that was much closer to the water than what was used at the time. Still, the US Navy was in dire need of a larger carrier force and bought the ship in 1942 to confront the incessant Japanese aggression. Even if the authentic flat top was unfit for combat and had only sailed in freshwater, Commander Richard F. Whitehead had a unique idea that would have USS Wolverine play a crucial role in military history as part of a fundamental operation in the effort against the Axis powers. Safe Waters As the United States debated joining the war in Europe, the U.S. Navy was in need of tens of thousands of qualified pilots and deck crews ready to perform carrier ship operations should the necessity arrive. However, training the crews was tricky, as none of the six existing carriers could be spared for training, and even if they were, the ships faced likely threats from German and Japanese submarines along the Atlantic and Pacific coastlines. Anticipating the need for a carrier used explicitly for crew training, Commander Richard F. Whitehead, an aviation aide at Glenview Naval Air Station in Chicago, suggested an idea to the Bureau of Ships. According to Commander Whitehead, converting Great Lakes steamers into aircraft carriers would enable the Navy to carry a training program in the safe American waters of the Great Lakes, the largest freshwater bodies on the planet. Commander Whitehead's option to repurpose a lake steamer would limit resource occupation, leaving funds for more critical operations. In addition, a common aircraft carrier would be too wide to fit through. The idea was not far-fetched. During World War I, the North American Great Lakes were a strategically important area, as iron ore was continuously transported to steel-making plants along the nearby states. In addition, several shipyards along the shore of the Great Lakes built military vessels like cargo ships, tugboats, and submarines. After the ships were launched, the new military vessels would float down to Chicago, transit through the city's drainage canal connecting with the Mississippi River, and eventually sail to the Gulf of Mexico to be placed in service. Although the Bureau of Ships initially ignored the commander, the proposal was fast-tracked by Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Ernest J. King following the devastating attack on Pearl Harbor, initiating a never-before-seen project in America. CNB. Originally launched on November 9, 1912, CNB was the largest and most expensive sidewheel steamship on the Great Lakes. The coal-burning pleasure cruise ship from the Cleveland and Buffalo Transit Company was packed with luxurious features, amenities, and entertainment, including an orchestra that was placed in a strategic point so that the sound would spread throughout the entire vessel and delight the 1,500 passengers. During its heyday, when World War I ravaged across the Atlantic, CNB was filled with upscale travelers circling Buffalo, Cleveland, Detroit, and Chicago. However, as the Great Depression tore through the country during the early 1930s, ticket sales slumped significantly, and the ship's future remained uncertain for almost a decade. Then, in March of 1942, the company sold the steamliner to the United States Navy for a price of $756,000 and designated her as IX-64, an unclassified miscellaneous auxiliary vessel. Months later, the Navy also required Greater Buffalo, establishing the so-called Corn Belt Fleet, as a pair of former luxury liners refurbished to serve as carrier trainers. Rebirth When CNB arrived at the American Shipbuilding Company in Buffalo in the spring of 1942, she had her top decks removed and stripped from all her elegant furniture. The once majestic luxury ship looked nothing like her old self. Great Lake ships had been repaired there before, but the transformation feat required by the Navy had never been done before. The conversion of the passenger ship into an aircraft carrier began on May 10, 1942, and because of the vessel's massive size, the process had to be done while the boat was anchored and still afloat. At the project's peak, over 1,250 ship workers labored in round-the-clock shifts, installing the new features and equipment as quickly as possible. The construction's main effort was removing all of the steamliner's upper structure to make space for a flat-top-style deck and its accompanying arresting gear. At 550 feet, the Oakwood landing deck was only two-thirds the size of an actual carrier. Atop the flat structure, the ship was fitted with a simple and basic communication system in order to leave the flight deck as unobstructed as possible for the landing and takeoff training exercises. The ship's islands were built to resemble the Navy's combat carriers. 
However, she was not fitted with elevators, hangars, maintenance facilities, or catapults. She was also not armored or protected, as the former steamliner would never leave safe waters. Training Program CNB was commissioned as USS Wolverine in honor of Michigan, the Wolverine State, on August 12, 1942. During the commissioning ceremony, mostly closed to the public, Captain Ross P. Slabach addressed his 270-person crew, stating, quote, If you men work as hard and determinedly as these men who work to convert this ship, we will have the ultimate in efficiency. The first aircraft landing on the U.S. Navy's latest carrier happened in September of 1942, only four months after the upgrade had begun. The other repurposed steamer, Greater Buffalo, was commissioned one year later as USS Sable. The Corn Belt Fleet was now ready to begin its new military career, and Wolverine started operations in January of 1943. The two makeshift aircraft carriers' home port was the United States Navy Pier, designated to the 9th Naval District Carrier Qualification Training Unit, located in Lake Michigan. USS Wolverine would leave the Navy Pier at dawn and head a mile offshore to begin flight operations. From then until dusk, the Corn Belt Fleet's pilot and deck crews trained for their future missions and would repeat the activities seven days a week. For a hopeful trainee to become qualified for carrier operations, the pilot had to complete eight successful takeoffs and ten landings. The trainees had clear instructions to keep their aircraft's cockpits open in case they crash-landed in the ocean and had to make a quick escape, making training during the winter particularly grueling. Despite the repeated maneuvers and exercises, training on Lake Michigan came with its shortcomings, as the wind and overall conditions were extremely mild and unlike what the pilots would face on the war-torn seas. The training program was even suspended at several points because of this reason. The calm air also kept heavy frontline combat planes like the Grumman F-6F Hellcat, the Vought F-4U Corsair, and the Grumman TBF Avenger from getting ideal tail movement for safe touchdowns. In addition, takeoffs were also challenging, and most Navy variant aircraft, including lightweight versions like the SNJ Texan trainers, had trouble operating from the Coal Belt Fleet's Wolverine and Sable. An important duty. Despite the weather limitations, the carrier pilot training program in the Great Lakes was a resounding success, and by May 7, 1943, the 7,000th successful takeoff and landing was carried out from Wolverine. Later exercises included testing the first TV-guided missiles. The success of these particular trials in 1943 led to the implementation of the TDR-1 unmanned aerial vehicle as part of a top-secret combat operation conducted for the rest of the war in the Bougainvillea amphibian campaign in New Guinea, ending with an Allied win. From the training start in September of 1942 until the end of the war three years later, USS Wolverine conducted training operations on her deck for thousands of hopeful trainees, and the Corn Belt Fleet ended up graduating nearly 18,000 U.S. Navy flyers, over 116,000 landings. Amongst the lengthy list of Navy graduates were Lieutenant Junior Grade and future President of the United States, George H.W. Bush, who described the experience as the coldest he'd ever been. Overall, the program ended up losing eight pilots and less than 300 planes. Then, as World War II ended, there was no need for carrier pilots, and the Corn Belt Fleet was decommissioned weeks later. Although the initial plan was to turn USS Sable into a museum, both ships were eventually sold for scrap and sent to a shipyard to be broken up. All that remains of Wolverine and Sable are photos and newsreel footage, but both eventually earned the American Campaign Medal and World War II Victory Medal for their service. Despite never shooting in anger, the contributions of the Corn Belt Fleet to the war effort, as well as the exceptional work done by the Buffalo ship workers, are noted and applauded by military historians. The modified liners prepared thousands of naval aviators for the dangerous job of wartime naval operations, and both Sable and Wolverine remain the only freshwater, coal-driven, side paddlewheel aircraft carriers used by the Navy. Thank you for watching our Dark Seas video. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to give us a like and leave a comment below. Also hit the bell icon to be notified of all our newest videos, and subscribe to this and all our other Dark Documentaries channels for more exciting historical content.